This is an iPhone. It's sold by an American company, Apple, made by Taiwanese manufacturers, and features components made in places like Germany, Japan, and South Korea. Since being released, it's become the most successful tech product ever. The iPhone is an incredible globalization success story. But did you know it's secretly British? That's right. In fact, so are around 99% of the world's smartphones. How is that possible? To understand why, we're going to need to learn about one of the most fascinating companies in the history of tech. They're a semiconductor company that's never made a single chip. Let's dive in. 1979 was a very eventful year in the United Kingdom. In January, tens of thousands of public sector workers started a strike in what became known as the Winter of Discontent. In May, Margaret Thatcher became the nation's first ever female leader. And in October, a documentary started a revolution. The Mighty Micro is probably the most influential TV program ever shown in the UK. At the time, computing in Britain was basically just a niche activity for nerds. But across six episodes, the computer scientist Dr. Christopher Evans argued that microprocessors would transform the whole of society. He warned that unless immediate action was taken to educate the British public about computers, then the UK would be left behind. That warning immediately raised an alarm inside a government already struggling to prevent the country from falling into recession. The newly elected Thatcher government knew it needed to act. The end result was the Computer Literacy Project, an incredibly ambitious BBC campaign to teach people everything from how microprocessors worked to how computers would impact education and white collar work. As part of this work, the BBC decided to commission a new home computer, which would serve as the example model used to explain the principles of computing. Everyone in the British computing industry knew that winning the contract would basically guarantee them millions of pounds. It quickly came down to just two two companies. The first was Sinclair Research. Sinclair Research was headed by Clive Sinclair, an entrepreneur who'd previously run a company which released the first slimline calculator. The other candidate was a company named Acorn, started by an engineer named Christopher Curry. Curry and Sinclair had history. In fact, they'd previously been business partners. The company Sinclair used to run before Sinclair Research had run into financial problems and needed a bailout from the UK government, which resulted in them basically taking the company over. Sinclair used that as an opportunity to pivot into home computers, and he asked Curry, his most talented engineer, to help him do it. In June of 1978, Sinclair Research, then known as Science of Cambridge, released its first product, the MK14. The MK14 was really successful. It sold about 15,000 units, which was a lot at the time. But the two men soon had a falling out about the direction of the company. Curry wanted to continue the development of the MK14, while Sinclair wanted to branch out into other products. So Curry quit, and together with an Austrian researcher and entrepreneur, named Herman Hauser, he soon started a new company. They called it Cambridge Processor Unit, CPU. Their first customer was a business that made fruit machines, a kind of slot machine that's popular in the UK. By January 1979, Curry and Hauser were ready to release their first product, a microcomputer designed by a Cambridge student named Sophie Wilson and modeled on an automated cow feeder. But they were worried. They knew that they could build a decent business just by doing things like making controllers for fruit machines. But releasing their own product that was a way bigger risk. So they decided to launch a new product under a different trading name to hedge their risk. They wanted something that alluded to the amazing potential of the computer industry, with the added bonus of appearing before Apple in the phone book. So they called the new division Acorn Computer, and the new product, the Acorn System 1. The sales of the System 1 were good enough to convince Curry that Acorn could grow into something mighty. The System series eventually evolved into the Atom, Acorn's first computer aimed squarely at the home market. But by then, the company Chris Curry had left, Sinclair Research, had become the UK's leading computer manufacturer. They'd released the ZX80. It was massively popular, and customers often needed to wait months to get one. When Clive Sinclair heard about the Computer Literacy Project, he wrote to the BBC informing them that he'd soon be releasing the follow-up to the ZX80. The new computer, the ZX81, would be cheaper and more advanced. Plus, he argued, by the time the BBC series aired, more than 100,000 people would be using it. So the choice came down to Sinclair's ZX81 or Acorn. But Acorn weren't just going to show the BBC the Atom. They'd already been working on a successor, the Proton, which would have better performance. There was just one problem. The Proton only existed on paper. The Acorn team was given just one week to build a working prototype, so they got to work. The project was led by Sophie Wilson, who by this stage had joined Acorn as an employee. After four days, she had a prototype. But the software was full of bugs, so she had to stay up all night trying to debug it. She remembers watching the wedding of Prince Charles and Lady Diana Spencer on a small portable TV while trying to debug and resolder the prototype. It was really hard work. 
but it would all be worth it because the BBC ended up awarding the contract to Acorn. And although I'm sure they didn't grasp it at the time, they just made a decision that would have huge consequences, not just for the UK, but for the entire world. The Proton was rebadged as the BBC Micro. At first, just 12,000 were made, but it went on to sell 1.5 million units and become the most influential computer in British history. At its peak, there was a BBC Micro in almost every classroom in the UK. It made Chris Curry and Herman Hauser millionaires, and Acorn a success. But there was no time for complacency, because a new product had just arrived that would change the game. You're looking at a small portable computer called the IBM 5100. IBM's PC transformed desktop computing from a niche hobby into a must-have business tool. Part of the reason why was because of its superior performance, which it achieved thanks to a 16-bit Intel 8088 CPU. 8-bit designs like the BBC Micro just couldn't compete. The team at Acorn saw the performance of the IBM PC and other computers like the Apple Lisa, which popularized the concept of a graphical user interface, and decided to develop a computer aimed at business users. They set themselves an ambitious goal, a 10x performance improvement from the BBC Micro, but at the same price. Sophie Wilson and the rest of the engineers began looking around for available CPU designs. Most existing 16-bit designs only delivered marginal performance improvements compared to the Micro. They almost always needed a large number of support chips to operate, which made them consume lots of power and pushed up the price. They asked a leading American chip maker for their 16-bit design, but were turned down. The emerging 32-bit designs cost even more. Acorn's engineers realized that nothing currently on the market could meet their needs. It looked like they were stuck, until they read one of the papers which Acorn's co-founder Herman Hauser left on someone's desk. In the paper, two UC Berkeley academics discussed the design and implementation of a new kind of processor. The design was called the Reduced Instruction Set Computer, or RISC. The two academics, David Patterson and Carlos Sakin, argued that you could achieve most low-level operations faster by delivering shorter, more powerful instructions. And that might mean you could build faster, more efficient processors. During a visit to the Western Design Center in Phoenix, Arizona, the Acorn team noticed that the chips were being designed by sticking things to drawing boards with sticky tape. It made them realize that if people could build an effective microprocessor under those resource constraints, they could do it too. So they got to work. Sophie Wilson wrote a simulation of the processor, known as the instruction set, in just 808 lines of code in a version of BASIC designed specifically for the micro. On a per-line basis, that might be the most valuable code ever written. Acorn picked a Silicon Valley-based company called VLSI Technology to physically design and fabricate the chip. The first chip was delivered on April 26th of 1985. After a couple of tweaks, the screen displayed the message, Hello world, I am ARM. Based on the RISC design, the ARM-1 used fewer transistors, less power, and generated less heat, all while delivering the superior performance that Acorn craved. The ARM-1 worked great, but despite its amazing performance, Acorn was actually in big financial trouble. It sounds crazy. After all, it had just won the BBC Micro contract. But a combination of supply chain problems, missed sales forecasts, development costs, and misjudged expansion plans meant that in February of 1985, one of Acorn's creditors issued a winding up petition. It turned out that Acorn actually owed more than 31 million pounds. It needed a lifeline. Thankfully, it got one. After a short in a short period of negotiations, the Italian IT company Olivetti bought a 49.3% stake in Acorn for £10.39 million. Acorn had been valued at £216 million just the previous year. The two founders, Chris Curry and Herman Hauser, saw their combined ownership stake fall from 85.7% to just 36.5%. A few months later, Acorn's major creditors agreed to write off almost £8 million in debts. The BBC waived 50% of the outstanding royalty payments, and Olivetti increased its stake in the company to almost 80%. The second refinancing further diluted Curry and Hauser's combined ownership share to less than 15%, and basically spelled the end of their major involvement with Acorn. Had the company they started gone out of business, the Apple we know today probably wouldn't exist. More about that later. For now, Acorn had suffered, but survived. And remember, they still had one incredible asset the ARM-1. The company's new leaders thought their processor deserved new hardware. So in 1987, Acorn released the Archimedes, the first RISC-based personal computer. It shipped with the ARM-1 processor and the Acorn's proprietary OS. Reviews all mentioned how fast it was. But disappointingly, most also mentioned the lack of software support. Acorn estimated they'd sell 20,000 Archimedes 
1980s machines by the end of 1987, and 120,000 by the end of 1988. But by the middle of 1988, they'd only sold about 14,000. It was popular in the UK, but barely made a splash in bigger markets like the US, where people preferred computers like the Atari ST or the Amiga. Acorn's flagship risk-based personal computer was kind of a flop. Just a few years after winning the most important contract in British computing, and then designing the most innovative microprocessor on the market, Acorn suddenly had a problem. The Archimedes, which was their attempt to break into the PC market, was struggling. And the incredible advance that Sophie Wilson had made with the ARM1 was in danger of going to waste. Because of its risk-based architecture and unique instruction set, the ARM1 provided good performance while using less power than almost anything else on the market. But it was tough to make that advantage count in the age of desktop computing. Acorn needed to find a better use case for the ARM1. They found one in Silicon Valley, but not from their silicon partner, VLSI Technology. Instead, the answer came from Apple. Around the time Acorn developed the ARM1, Apple created an internal research lab. The purpose of this lab, which they called the Advanced Technology Group, was to research technologies that were outside the scope of any individual product group. It was basically Google X, but 25 years earlier. Engineers at the Advanced Technology Group loved the ARM1 processor because of its elegant design and low power consumption. They thought it would be perfect for the Apple II line of personal computers. So they got in touch with the team at Acorn. The collaboration resulted in the creation of an experimental prototype for a risk-based personal computer to replace the Apple II. It was codenamed Mobius. It contained a modified ARM processor, and it was incredible. The Mobius performed better than any of Apple's existing processors. You'd think that would be great news, right? Wrong. The Mobius was perceived as a threat by the existing product groups. After all, how could Apple release a competitor to the Macintosh with a processor made by a direct competitor? It didn't really make any sense. So the Mobius project was quietly shut down. But that wasn't the end of Apple's collaboration with Acorn. Shortly after the Mobius, Apple turned its attention to another product. Apple started working on the Newton in 1987. The processor had to meet stringent benchmarks for performance, power consumption, and cost, all while running on batteries. There was only one processor that came close to meeting all of those requirements, the ARM1, but it still wasn't perfect. So Apple and Acorn agreed that they'd develop a modified version of the ARM processor, which would do everything the Newton needed. After the Mobius fiasco, though, Apple was wary. They wanted to use ARM technology, but didn't want to base a product, especially one that they thought would be really successful, on a direct competitor's intellectual property. So Apple, Acorn, and VLSI technology came up with a solution. They'd create a new company, which would own the IP for the Newton's processor. It was structured as a joint venture. Apple invested $3 million, and in return would own part of the new company. There's some confusion about whether it was 30% or 43%, but either way, it was a big chunk. VLSI technology would provide the design tools and fabrication expertise, and Acorn would provide 12 of their engineers from the Advanced Research and Development Group that had developed the ARM1 processor. In November of 1990, Advanced Risk Machines was born. This is where the acronym ARM comes from, although today you won't find the words Advanced Risk Machines anywhere on their website. Acorn's story would continue until late 2015, but ARM's story had just begun. Robin Saxby, an engineer with experience in the semiconductor industry, was appointed as the inaugural CEO. And in 1993, the Newton launched, complete with an ARM 610 microprocessor. It was Apple's first handheld device, with features like a touchscreen and email. It was a precursor to the iPad and iPhone but it totally failed. It was expensive, and its handwriting recognition was so bad, the Simpsons made fun of it. Hey Dolph, take a memo on your Newton. Beat up Martin. Bah! Maybe people just weren't ready, but despite being a massive failure, the Newton would actually end up being great news for both companies. Let me explain, starting with ARM. Even though the Newton had failed to kick off the mobile revolution, ARM's new CEO didn't want to pivot to the PC market. For one thing, companies like IBM, Sun Microsystems, and Hewlett Packard had already cornered the market for microprocessors that powered desktop computers. And more importantly, the alliance between Microsoft and Intel, known as Wintel, meant you couldn't run Windows on computers with ARM chips. Basically, it was Intel or nothing. And ARM was too small to break in, but maybe small was the way to go. Just because the Newton failed didn't mean all handheld devices would. The other thing the failure of the Newton did was teach Robin Saxby, ARM's new CEO, that they couldn't pin their hopes on the success of a single product. One more failure would probably mean the end of ARM. So he devised an unusual business model. ARM would stick to its role of just designing microprocessors, and it would license the use of its microprocessors, or more specifically, the instruction set 
first written by Sophie Wilson to other companies. This achieved two things at once. Firstly, it would make ARM a partner to every company that licensed its designs, which meant that ARM architecture would be used in a larger ecosystem. And secondly, it would generate a dual revenue stream for ARM, the upfront licensing fees, plus ongoing royalties for every device that shipped with an ARM product inside. At the time, not many people thought the ARM business model would make a big difference. In the early 1990s, the desktop computer was still king, and Wintel was building a monopoly in that exact sector. But the times were changing and fast, and ARM was about to hit a big turning point. In 1993, Texas Instruments, which was one of the world's biggest semiconductor companies, was approached by Nokia to develop a processor for a new mobile phone. Texas Instruments, which was already using ARM architecture, suggested a design based on the new ARM 7 microprocessor. But Nokia couldn't see a way to make that design small enough or cost competitive, so they said no. In response, ARM worked with Texas Instruments to tweak the instruction set. The result was the ARM 7T, a processor that was still 32-bit, but could process 16-bit input on the fly through dedicated circuits inside the chip. Nokia loved the new processor and put it inside the new 6110. The 6110 was a big step forward for mobile phones. Thanks to the ARM 7T, it was the first phone to ship with features that would become standard, like menu icons and the game Snake. It went on to be a massive success. Nokia sold 41 million cell phones in 1998 and eclipsed Motorola to become the biggest mobile phone manufacturer in the world. The 1990s mobile revolution had arrived, and it was great news for ARM. Suddenly, their processors were inside one of the hottest consumer products in the world. Remember, the biggest strength of the ARM instruction set was that it was energy efficient. And ARM's business model, introduced by its CEO, Robin Saxby, and formalized by the company's work with Texas Instruments, meant that partners could modify the design to best suit their needs. The ARM 7 family went on to become the world's most widely used 32-bit embedded processor family family, with more than 170 silicon licensees and over 10 billion units shipped since its introduction in 1994. These weren't just used in mobile phones. The PlayStation 2, Nintendo DS, and even the Roomba used processors from the ARM 7 family. The 1990s were very good for ARM. On April 17, 1998, the company listed on the NASDAQ. In less than 13 years, ARM had turned 808 lines of basic code written by Sophie Wilson into a billion dollars. Everything was looking great, but over in Cupertino, things were looking bleak. By the mid-90s, Apple was in deep trouble. The company's leaders didn't have a clear idea of how to respond to the PC threat. An alliance with IBM and Motorola resulted in a new risk-based instruction set architecture, PowerPC, which performed well but undermined Apple's point of difference. New versions of the Macintosh, like the Quadra, Centris, and Performa, confused customers. And attempts at game-changing new products like the Newton mostly failed. How bad was it? Well, three different CEOs in a four-year span presided over $1.7 billion in losses. IBM tried to buy Apple for $40 a share in 1993. Apple said no, but then tried to get IBM interested again after their stock price fell way below that. At one point, Apple was hours away from being acquired by Sun Microsystems. Things looked really bad, and people forget this about Apple. But Apple had something stashed away for a rainy day, their equity stake in ARM. The company began slowly selling off their holdings. They used part of the proceeds to buy Next software for cash and stock in 1996. Buying Next did two things for Apple. It gave them control of technology that they wanted to use as the foundation for Mac OS X, and it brought Steve Jobs back to the company in an advisory role. Of course, Jobs wouldn't remain a bystander for very long. By July of 1997, he was the interim CEO following the resignation of Gil Emilio. The next month, he appeared together with Bill Gates at the Macworld Expo to announce a historic agreement. Microsoft promised to support Office for the Mac for the next five years, while Apple agreed to make Internet Explorer the default browser for the Mac. Gates also promised to invest $150 million for shares of Apple's non-voting preferred stock. People were skeptical. The deal basically handed Microsoft a monopoly on operating systems. But Jobs didn't exactly have much leverage. Apple was reportedly just 90 days away from bankruptcy. Jobs also moved quickly to cancel money-losing projects like the Newton. At the same time he was cutting costs, 
He also continued selling off Apple's stake in ARM. By February of 1999, Apple had sold off $1.1 billion of ARM stock. It was a pretty great return considering that they only invested $3 million initially, and it helped Apple stay in business. Jobs introduced successful new products like the iMac and iPod. But in the early 2000s, he started noticing something. Lots of people were carrying around mobile phones, MP3 players, and Blackberries. Wouldn't they just be happier with a single device that performed all of those functions? Jobs also realized that as mobile phones got better, they'd start challenging the dominant market position of the iPod. Jobs knew where those trends were pointing. So he asked his head hardware, software, and design engineers to start work on a highly confidential project to design a new Apple phone. And we are calling it iPhone. The first generation iPhone was packed with new technology, like small lithium ion batteries, touchscreens, and Gorilla Glass. But in order to make everything work together, it needed a powerful, energy efficient CPU. There seemed like an obvious choice, Intel. It could both manufacture and help design the chip. Plus, it had already been working closely with Apple for years. But then something interesting happened. Intel's then CEO, Paul Ottolini, said no. The company was making billions of dollars from its duopoly with Microsoft built on the foundation of the mighty x86 architecture. And the iPhone was the first product of its type. There was no guarantee it would be successful. The numbers just didn't work out on the spreadsheet. I should note, there's some disagreement about how exactly this played out. In his biography, Steve Jobs said Apple turned Intel down because they were too slow and because Apple didn't want to strengthen a direct competitor. But however it happened, Intel's failure here opened the door for ARM. ARM had already supplied the CPU for the iPod, which by 2007 was generating almost half of Apple's total revenues. And of course, it helped Apple avoid bankruptcy in the 90s. That's how the very first iPhone ended up containing a Samsung-built ARM system on a chip. Every single one of the 2.3 billion iPhones sold since then has included an ARM core of some kind. It's one of the most successful and lucrative collaborations in business history. And it's the reason your iPhone is secretly British. So is every iOS device and 99% of the world's smartphones. Even your Kindle, Fitbit, and DJI drone are British. The reason why is that business model Robin Saxby designed all those years ago. The concept of a semiconductor company that outsources manufacturing isn't that uncommon. NVIDIA and AMD both do it. This approach reduces costs, but it also reduces your profit margins and makes you really reliant on your manufacturing partner. That's why Intel chooses to design and manufacture its chips in-house. But ARM actually goes one step further. It doesn't even sell chips into the marketplace. You'll never see an ARM brand on a specific chip like you would with NVIDIA. Instead, it designs various IPs, like instruction set architecture and microprocessors and licenses those designs to anyone who wants to use them. ARM's customers then take that IP and design it into silicon. ARM is like if a group of talented chefs wrote elaborate recipes and sold them to restaurants around the world. Sometimes the restaurants follow the recipe. Sometimes, with the permission of the chefs, they tweak it a bit. And whenever someone buys a meal at one of those restaurants, the chefs get a 1-2% to 2 cut. ARM's business model is great because it creates a positive incentive loop. As ARM's designs become better, so do the devices their processors are used for. And as those devices sell more, ARM makes more money in royalties, which the company invests back into R&D to make better designs. Today, ARM works with pretty much everybody. Apple, Google, Microsoft, Qualcomm, Samsung, TSMC, ByteDance, you name it. And their energy efficient processors have perfectly positioned ARM to take advantage of trends like handheld devices, wearables, and cloud computing. ARM's innovative design and unique business model attracted lots of attention. One of the people watching closely happened to own the world's biggest investment fund. His name was Masason. And in September of 2016, that investment fund, SoftBank, bought ARM for 24 billion pounds. It was the most ever paid for a European technology company. And in 2020, the collaboration between Apple and ARM went to the next level. When Tim Cook said that the Mac was transitioning to Apple Silicon, what he really meant was that Apple was shifting production of the Mac's CPU from Intel's x86 architecture to a system on a chip based on ARM processors, much like the iOS range of devices. It was a sign that ARM is encroaching on the territory that Intel has held onto for decades. And it's just the latest step in the fascinating decades-long symbiosis between ARM and Apple. When you zoom out, the numbers are truly staggering. ARM claims that more than 250 billion ARM-based chips have been shipped. 
Revenues have never been higher. And with over 1,000 global partners, including companies working in emerging areas like machine learning, cloud computing, and even the metaverse, those numbers will probably keep going up. ARM CEO Rene Haas has a saying, wherever computing happens, ARM will be there. Today, computing happens everywhere. And tomorrow, computing will happen in places we can't even imagine. And ARM will be there. To learn more about how Apple's new product, the Vision Pro, marks the culmination of Tim Cook's career, just watch this video next. Thanks a lot.